how are you? It's a uh, Friday morning, just gone 11 o'clock. Uh, I'm Lee Med. Welcome to this DG Chamber webinar. We are delighted to be joined uh, by our colleague uh, James Slater from Quibiti. Good morning, James. Good morning, Lee. How are you doing? Absolutely. I'm, I'm doing grand. I'm doing Friday. This, the, sky is, the sky is sunny. It's blue. And uh, knock on wood, my internet has been holding out this morning. I, I'm sure like many, many people across D&G, it's been uh, slow this week and uh, slower than normal for some strange reason. I think uh, everyone in the region is now working from home and they've got, they're doing everything they can and that is causing some issues. I know we're going to talk about that throughout yeah. the course of this webinar. Lots and lots that we do need to try and uh, get through. Lots of questions came in in advance and I know there's lots of things that we'll, we'll talk on throughout the course of the morning. But uh, let's just get people familiar with yourself, James, because uh, you very much a familiar face uh, yes. across Dumfries and Galloway. You, you know your stuff when it comes to, to IT, mobiles and tech support, but they might not necessarily know about uh, Quibiti. Tell us a little bit about this. Yeah, so we're a new start business. They um, started trading in September of last year, um, based up at the Crichton. And um, basically what we do is we um, create intelligent spaces. So um, we have a sort of our why and our mission is to make businesses better versions of themselves. And we do that by connecting people, technology and environment. So we take um, any office setting or um, social space and we make sure that the people who frequent them have the best technology and to make those spaces um, intelligent and make them the people that are in there more productive um, and give the best experience um, to those people. So that, that's what we do. So we have a couple of uh, different sides to the business and then obviously today we'll, we'll focus on more of the technology and the telecom side of the business um, and hopefully I can give a bit of insight into some things that could help you work from home a little bit more securely and a little bit more um, productively so yeah we'll see where we get to hopefully it works. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure it will. And again, I need to say uh, congratulations, of course, Quibiti. It's still a relatively new business, but of course, shortlisted for most promising yeah. new business in the DG Business Awards 2020. Uh, hopefully very soon we'll be able to uh, figure out when we're going to uh, make those announcements and, and hand out those trophies yeah. as well. So uh, uh, congratulations on, on, on the progression of the business yeah, uh, so you. far. So far. Thank but you let's, for that. Let's crack straight into this. If anyone has a question throughout the course of the of the webinar, it's really easy to get in touch. You can either just uh, raise your hand using a little uh, hand raise button at the bottom of your screen, or you can just post your message into the chat and we'll pick up on that and, and we'll, we'll ask James the questions as we're going along. But, uh, you know, here we are, James, uh, eight weeks into lockdown, many of us now working at home, and I think it's it's all caught us by surprise. We we had some idea there'd be some changes, but we probably didn't have an idea it was going to be a case of pick up the laptop, pick up the computer, go home, and essentially, fingers crossed, hope for the best. Uh, but this is where we find ourselves, uh, and I think now we're probably realising as we've got another three weeks uh, ahead of us at least. Uh, there's probably some things we, we should be doing because I'll, I'm going to hold my hands up. One of these people, I picked up my laptop from the office, came home, I've set myself up a little space in the back office, uh, plugged it into my internet and I've just been going on as normal. But yeah. then again, I was having a conversation the other day with one of my colleagues and we were talking, it's like, well, he's got very sensitive data on his laptop. I've got sensitive data on, on mine. Uh, we know when we're in the office, we're on a secure network. Yes. Uh, but here, this the office that I have at home is being shared by, it's being shared by Mrs. Med, it's being shared by my, my set-top boxes. Everything yep. is on an open network. What should I be doing to make sure that the data that's on my laptop is more secure and isn't safe? Because there's a whole load of important stuff on there. Yeah, no, definitely, and you know, obviously, we we have, we are setting a routine of you know, like you said, you know, we're in we're in our offices. We have you know probably IT support that help us in our workplace settings. We may have IT people that ensure that um, those networks are as secure as they possibly can be. But you know, for the businesses that we look after um, on a managed uh, support level, and um, they have coped really well with that transition from having to. Move very rapidly from the office to home. Um, not all of them um, had all of the things in place, um, but they worked really hard and they got there. And people are working from home, but like you say, that brings its own risks and its own sort of um, uh, things that we need to work around and make sure that um, although we're not in the office, that we can have a similarly secure network. Um, now, office networks. Um, uh, 
professional level networks, you know, they um, are constructed in different ways from how your home network works. Um, and um, the, the emphasis on layered security um, in a professional setting, so in your office, um, you will have multiple layers of security um, that allows you to access the resources in your network and keep you secure. At home, unfortunately, we don't always have that unless you are maybe an IT guy that's, you know, bringing that stuff into the house. But for the majority of users, they have a router that's been given to them by their ISP. It's all the default settings. They take it out of the box, they plug it in, they connect their devices and off they go. And that's great, you know, for ease of use and on a consumer level, that's exactly what we're looking for. This, um, I hate using the term the new normal because this probably isn't the new normal. There will be another normal, I'm sure, as this um, situation progresses. But it probably just now, uh, you know, eight weeks in, it is the time to actually, you know, maybe sit down when there's a little bit um, more time in the day to sit and think about um, security and how we um, can be as secure as we possibly can be in our home. So I've um, sort of put together a sort of few bullet points and I'm going to share my screen and we can just talk through some of the things that you can do with your home network to sort of um, bring those levels of security as close to what you would find in the office. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen and we can we can go through that in two seconds. So can everybody see that okay? Yep, that's grand. Yeah. So yeah, so obviously we're, we, you know, we're talking about securing your home network. Um, we take it for granted when we go to the office that you know everything, all the security measures are in place. You know that's just the, what happens in the workplace. At home, slightly different scenario. Um, so unlike a business network and a home network, business networks tend to have, as I mentioned before, multiple layers of security. So you will have um, firewalls, routers. Um, universal threat management devices that you know do web content filtering, antivirus, anti-malware. There's lots of um, layers, if you like, um, protecting the end user from the internet and um, outside sources accessing your internal resources. Um, at home, you have a router, and that generally is all you've got, and that's doing all of the jobs and all of the, the workload that um, all these single devices and layered devices in a business network would um, tend to take care of. Um, like I said, you know, consumer-based products are generally um, designed and manufactured for you know ease of use, out of the box operability. So as soon as you take it out of the box, you plug it in, off you go, you're working. Um, we as consumers, that's what we, we demand. So that's what the suppliers give us. Um, and for day-to-day -day use, yeah, generally okay. But in a, when you're um, accessing corporate resources, we maybe need to think about how we secure that as much as we can, um, and as easily and you know as cheaply as we can as well. Um, so, in every uh, home setting, in every home environment, the the, the piece of um, equipment that um, lets you access the internet is your router, uh, and that obviously gives most people are connected via Wi-Fi. Um, so the Wi-Fi and the router are the edge um, of your home network and the, the front-facing part um, from your devices to see the, to the internet. So it is the first, and in most cases, the last layer of defence in a home network. Um, and everything in our home is connected to the internet via our router. So it's doing lots of different um, jobs and it's, you know, it's really is an important, it's the most important piece of kit in our network. Um, but it's also a forgotten piece of equipment because, like I said, we take it out of the box, we plug it in, it sits in the corner, it twinkly lights, it does its job and we tend to just forget about it. Um, but there really are some things that we need to do to maintain those and keep them up to date and make sure that they're giving us the best performance and security as, as possible. So simple things you can do um, on your router. I say we take it out of the box. It has the default admin password usually set. They tend to be admin admin or admin and password, and that's really pretty insecure. So um, we'd encourage you to log on to your router where you can and change those passwords. If you've not already done that, you know, make sure that, that you do that. Um, your Wi-Fi um, will um, broadcast a name, which we call your SSID, so it would be, what, and it's generally the default setting of what the router's called, so BT Hub would be BT Hub, etc, etc, and the password will be whatever's on the little card on the back of the router. So again, um, when you're logging in to change the admin password, you know, change that um, Wi-Fi password at the same time, and do that regularly, just like we would encourage you to change the passwords on your devices, or uh, on any of the cloud services that you use, the router password and the network password, you should change them regularly as well. The drawback of doing it regularly, changing um, those passwords is obviously 
all the, your um, home devices that will be disconnected. Um, so you have to go back around and reconnect them. But again, it's um, security over convenience. You know, what do you what, what do you make the priority? And because we're working from home and we're accessing corporate information, then sh security should be you know come above convenience. Um, so when you're when you're um, changing your network password, you know, use the the highest level of security that your router can provide. Generally, that's what we call WPA2. Um, I, and what that does is that it means that you have to set a, a password, not just a PIN code. So uh, make that password as complex and memorable, but you know, not easily guessable either. Um, and that encrypts um, the transmissions of um, data between your devices and the router and then out onto the, to the network, uh, onto the internet. So, you know, again, Passwords are really important, very simple thing to do, but a, a great layer of defence on, on your network. When you're on that router and you're changing those passwords, you know, check and make sure that the router's up to date. So all um, devices like routers, switches, wireless access points, they run a low-level software called firmware. Um, most modern routers will update their firmware behind the scenes uh, automatically. But again, if you're in the, the admin control panel of your router, just double check that that's on, make sure that it is doing the updates. If it's not, and they're not up to date, um, you know, make sure you do those updates. Um, that firmware or that um, low level software that controls every aspect of your router. So that um, everything that happens on your router is uh, controlled by that software. And software goes out of date and hackers and, you know, people that like to take advantage of situations, they find loopholes, they find back doors in this software. Um, and the the firmware updates will, you know, hopefully eradicate any of those um, inadequacies in older versions of that. So keeping those up to date is very, very important. Again, when you're on that router, um, another layer of defence that your router will have, and most modern routers do have them inbuilt, is, is your firewall. So the firewall is um, a layer of security between the home network and the internet. And that allows you to do certain things like allow certain apps um, to face the internet, allow certain devices to see the internet. It will also allow people who are maybe trying to connect in remotely and um, gain access to the network. So you can shut down certain services and ports. And it's again, it's just another layer of protection that is built into your into your router. And generally they are on by default, but um, somewhere down the line, somebody maybe switched it off for convenience because their smart TV wouldn't connect to the internet or Amazon Alexa wouldn't work. So we make these sort of changes for um, ease of use, but, you know, we tend to forget to put them back on again. Um, we, uh, uh, so, you know, double check that they're on, make sure that it's, um, again, it's up to date and it's configured and it's blocking the things you don't want it to block. And again, firewalls, etc. it might seem a bit daunting to people, but, you know, we can we'll maybe share some advice over the next couple of days on our uh, social media about how firewalls work and how you can access those and um, manage them etc uh, again and, and all of this stuff that happens on the router so that is probably the most again because of that device is controlling all access from external to internal and internal to the internet it's the most important uh, device on your network and there are certain features on your network again because uh, on your router again because they are designed for ease of use. Um, so things like remote access, um, some routers will allow you to access them via the web, which um, will give services like um, allow you to dial into your Amazon Alexa, um, allow you to control your Sonos speaker remotely, um, all these kind of things that um, we we know are there. We might not use them all, but generally they would be switched on by default on the router. So if you don't need them and you're not using them, we would probably encourage you to disable those. Um, again, if you do need them and you do use them, they're not going to expose you to the worst parts of the internet. You're not going to be um, hacked just because they're on. But again, they just build that extra layer of security that um, we would tend to find in a business setting wouldn't be um, wouldn't be switched on, so we should need to try and sort of mimic what we can from the office back to the to the, to, the, to your house. So things like disable remote access, you know, um, do that. UPnP that stands for Universal Plug and Play, so that allows things like it is a protocol that allows devices such as smart TVs, um, Xboxes, gaming consoles, Amazon Alexas um, to connect to the internet um, very quickly. So you put the you put the name in, put the password in, and you're on. Um, so it takes out some 
um, pages of configuration, if you like, to get those devices activated. Again, it's all these are all designed for ease of use for a consumer. Um, but if you can disable it, we would encourage you to do that because they can be exploited um, by um, malware and um, people that are, would seek to take advantage of um, vulnerabilities in your system. So if you don't require it, switch it off. And all home routers, um, they have a button on them. Um, WPS, you'll usually see it on the front. And what that allows you to do is um, push the button and it will open your network up for a period of a couple of minutes. And then any devices that are wanting to connect to your network, they tend to be able to do it without inputting a password. And again, it's an ease of use feature. It's to make it convenient for the end user, but it does have its vulnerabilities in that. Um, it stands for a Wi-Fi protected setup. Um, but again, if you don't need it and you're happy with just typing the, the, or finding the network and typing the password in, then that is definitely the best route to take is to disable that. Um, because anybody can come in, press the button, and you know, you've got a, a, a device on your network that, you, that maybe shouldn't be there. So definitely, um, to look to disable that. James, if I could mm -hmm. just jump in here a sec, we've had a question uh, come in from the audience. It was yeah. about, uh, you mentioned we should always change uh, firewall settings, uh, your username on your router and such like that. Uh, somebody's came in and asked that actually, how do you do that? Where do you find that? Uh, how do you actually get into to, to make those changes? Yeah, so if you, if you look on your router, um, Usually on the back or the underside of the router, there will be a, a label and on that will contain certain information about your router. So it will give you the router's default IP address. So that is the address that um, every device on your network is given an address and uh, um, that address um, translates um, to send data towards the router and out onto the internet. So it's a basically a unique identifier for each device. So your router has a, a, a hard-coded um, IP address and they're usually something like 192.168.0.1 or .1.1. So what you would do there is you would open, look at that label on the bottom of the, of the, of the router, um, open up a web browser, type that address into the address bar on the, on the router, um, and then put in the, the, the admin details, so the username and password. And again, they're always printed on the bottom or the underside of the router, or there will be in a card that the, that's been in the router box. Um, if that's not there, you can, you, because of the defaults, you would tend to be able to guess that it's admin. Admin um, would be the would be the uh, username and password credentials for that. Or you can Google the make and model, and you will tend to find um, what the um, default passwords are. But you access it via a web browser, type in that address, and it will give you access to the control panel and all of the router settings behind that. And that's where all of this stuff is um, uh, configured from. Spot on. Thanks, James. I hope that answers your question. So yeah, so um, we're back, uh, back to the router, uh, and so we're on that control panel that we've just explained how to get onto there, um, and we're making those changes. Again, most modern routers will have give you an option to enable a guest network, and again, it's a, it's a we would encourage you to do that. Um, so you can have a, a network that's called whatever you decide that maybe the default network name, or you give it another name, and you can access you can enable guest networks on most modern routers. What that means is if Obviously, at the moment, people aren't visiting people's homes, etc. But when they do come in, instead of giving them the Wi-Fi password for um, your network, is give them the guest password. So that, mean, that means that their devices are separate from yours. Um, it will also, in, in most modern routers as well, when you enable that guest network, it will put a layer of security where the devices on the guest network can't see devices on your home network. Um, so they can't they can't speak to each other. So it may be that you even think about maybe putting some like maybe your smart TV on that guest network. You might put your Amazon Alexa on there, um, because again these devices create vulnerabilities and ways and means for people to access um, your devices, which contain your data and the things that you don't want people to see. So a guest network, if it's available, you know use that and only allow get when your guests come back to your house once we pass social distancing etc give them that password um, as opposed to your own network password. Yep. So that is um, in terms of the, the parts of your home network, the router um, and that gives out the Wi-Fi, it connects you to the internet, it is probably the single most important part of your network and it does a whole host of different jobs that in a business setting we would have multiple devices doing the same jobs that that one single device does. So it is um, 
it is important to keep it up to date and you know maybe try implementing some of these um, layers of security and hopefully um, you get the best out of your router. So. Thanks for that, James. There's just one other thing that's came in here, a, and somebody's asked a question: Should I be using a, a VPN? What, how does that? How does a VPN actually help in a in a home-based working system? Yeah. So, um, so a VPN is a virtual private network. What that does, if we can, there are VPN services that we can access via the network, and effectively, what that does, if you access the internet via a VPN, it hides. Um, it hides certain information about your connection, so it hides your IP address, um, which means that um, hack it makes it more difficult for hackers to or people to see um, your endpoint devices. Um, we would use VPNs um, to access corporate resources via the internet. Um, so most, um, and again, we're, and some of the other points we, we do touch on VPNs and how how we access those, but in a if I'm using, if I need to access resources in my office network, we would tend to access that via VPN. Basically, what it does is it opens up a tunnel um, from any network into my um, office network, and it's the you know again there's issues surrounding that in terms of levels of security. Um, but if you have a really secure VPN, it is a secure way to browse the internet and mask certain information about um, your endpoints, your devices um, to the outside world. So, yeah. And we also, some people will also use VPNs to access things like international TV services. Um, so they might use that to access US Netflix. Um, so they get extra TV programs and stuff like that. Or, you know, so that they can be used for that as well for entertainment purposes, but also for accessing a whole host of different things. So, yeah. Okay, thanks, James. So we we'll, we'll know some of the, the steps we can take to, to make our home networks more secure there if we are going to be at handling, as we said before, some, some really sensitive data, certainly yeah. in terms of the job that I do. I've got a database full of, of contacts and everything else like that. But uh, how do we look at our uh, devices? What kind of devices have we got? Because just now we've got laptops, we've got PCs, yeah. we've got tablets, we've got mobiles, all connecting to the internet and uh, all doing the same thing but in very much different ways yeah you know, yeah so you know like you know just a, a little sad statistic here but the average person in, in the uk they own about three and a half devices each so if you think about what you've got like you just said you've got a mobile you've got a tablet a laptop but and that's per person in your household so then you've got your common sort of devices like your smart tvs your your alexas your you know all these other sort of things that are all accessing the, the internet in some way shape or form um, and all going through that you know that poor little router that sits in the corner and you know doesn't get much attention that you know hence why it is an important device to, to maintain and again just like your router um, you know your devices are just as important if your router is your first line of defense um, in most cases your device is your last line of defense so if you're not protecting your device um, you know, you're leaving yourself open to all sorts of sort of carnage in in certain circumstances. Um, so again, just like back to the router and anything that we use, you know, passwords are really really important. They are a simple thing um, to enable. They're a simple thing um, to prevent people from accessing the the um, the stuff that's on your PC. You know, the data that's on there. A password can go so far. Um, if you've not got one on, you know, get get one set just now. Um, don't make it password. Don't make it your first and last name. And um, don't write it on a post-it note and stick it on the front of your um, laptop. That's just not very good. Um, you know, choose something that's complex, but choose something that's memorable. Um, and choose something that you know it's not easily guessed. And uh, some tips for passwords are, you know, um, instead of an E, use a use a number four. It looks like an E but it's a number four. Instead of a, an S, use a dollar sign or a five. Um, add some special characters in. Um, we worked to a colleague a few years ago, um, and we used to change our passwords every 60 days, and he used to change his password to the biscuit that he had with his cup of tea at 10 o'clock in the morning. So you'd have passwords like chocolate digestive, 1982 or something like that. You know, so no one's ever going to guess that because, you know, it's... How, how would you guess that? So look, look around, find something, and use that as your password. And certainly don't use um, password. <laughs> I've seen see lots of that. I've even seen customers recently who have had the same password for five, six, seven years. It's just 
it really, aye. Passwords are very, very important layer of security and something that you should look to change regularly. And from a business point of view, um, if you uh, have a device that's connected to your um, your office domain or your work domain, they will probably have um, some requirements in place regarding passwords. So they will change, um, you know, every 60 days, every 90 days, they might have certain complexities. So certain lengths of passwords, certain special characters, they might not remember the last five passwords. So you can't just keep changing it for the same password. So again, speak to your um, IT people. Um, and see if you know if you can't change the password, ask them if they can help you out and do that. Um, again, like the router, um, make sure that your devices are up to date and patched. Um, so your operating system, whether it be Windows or Apple, um, Android, whatever device that you're using, they will automatically update. Um, you can disable automatic updates, but we'd encourage to have them on. Um, Windows 10, for example, it will automatically update. It will download and install the updates. But it will require, in most cases, a restart of the, the of your laptop to apply those updates. Um, so just because they're downloaded and installed doesn't mean to say that they've actually been applied. And any of those updates that are maybe taking away vulnerabilities in the operating system, um, those vulnerabilities will remain until you make that until you do that restart. And you will get them popping up when you're in the middle of something, and it can be a nuisance. You can delay that restart. You can delay it by an hour, couple of hours, or you can do it at night time. So just you know, take time to make sure that once the updates are installed, make sure that you, that you apply you apply them. Um, and the same goes for uh, the software that you use on your devices. So if you're using things like Microsoft Office, you know, allow that to um, update. You know, um, people will find vulnerabilities, and that's the things that they exploit. If you're using things like Sage or CRM system, allow those updates to take place and make sure that you apply them because you know they are another layer of um, defence um, to protect your your data. Um, we'll just move on to the next one. Um, so again, yeah, if you don't have antivirus on or uh, malware uh, software, you know, install that. Make sure it's there. Most most laptops will ship now with a preloaded um, antivirus software. Again, it's up to you whether you use that. Your um, your uh, your business that that you operate from, they may you know tell you that you need to use a certain antivirus. They may provide you with that antivirus, but make sure you've got AV in, installed. Um, if you've not got one, Windows has one built in um, called Windows Defender. It's you know it's not the best, but it is well worth it putting on if you've not got any AV on your on your um, PC. And try and find one that's got maybe malware built into it. Some um, Antivirus uh, software will have antivirus, anti malware. It will um, scan websites that you're looking uh, to access. Some of them even come uh, bundled with VPN software in there to give an ad another added layer of uh, um, protection. And they're relatively inexpensive, usually twenty twenty five pound a, a year. You can get bundled deals for you know um, multiple devices or different family members, etc. So. You know, definitely make sure that those are there. And again, like the software, make sure they're up to date. Make sure the software is updated regularly. And um, and a virus, as an an electronic virus, is the same as a biological virus. The virus happens first, um, and the the vaccine comes afterwards. And it's the same with a, a, a digital virus. Viruses usually happen first. And then the vaccine will come and we call vaccines, if you like, in the digital sense, they're called definitions. So a part of your antivirus software that you need to make sure is up to date is, is the definition part. So make sure they're up to date, make sure that you're scanning regularly. You've got things like um, on-demand scanning. So when you open a file, it scans the file. When you save a, an attachment from an email, it scans that email. When you plug a USB in, it scans that. And also do full scans regularly. So set up that time aside and click on a full scan and scan the whole um, device, make sure it's, it's protected. Uh, James, just on that one, uh, when you say you should always have a, an antivirus or, or something along those lines to look after that malware, is there a, a package that, that you think is, is really user-friendly, is, is easy to use out the box or the download? I know personally, I used to use a McAfee an awful lot. I thought it was a great system. Yeah. The past couple of years, I thought it just, and I don't know if it was a psychological thing, it just seemed to really slow down my system. Yeah. So I changed over to, to a VAS, and I'm using the VAS suite of products just now, which personally yeah. I found from a home system is really good but is there something that uh, I'm not going to say is better than a VAST to get that 
that, that almost that hybrid between the, the home work balance that you could recommend? Yeah, I mean, so there's, there's some great websites on, if you just go onto Google and if you type in um, antivirus comparison, there's, there's like a, a bit like a comparison website for all the antivirus. So it will tell you the features that they've got and it will tell you where they rank in terms of security, operability. In some cases, um, some antivirus software can um, act like a virus, if you like. It can slow your system down. It can be too uh, uh, intrusive in terms of what it tries to do and slows it down and, and then your, your machine um, becomes so inoperable that it, it's like you've actually got a virus. So um, we um, provide a, a, a piece of software called Bitdefender. That's part of our managed service um, packages that we give to businesses. So it's a good alternative. Avast is a good one. It's a great um, one for um, home users. There's ones like Panda, um, you've got McAfee, you've got Norton, there's a whole host. Um, so, yeah, and, and they all have their, again, it's, you know, certain people like certain ones, so, yeah, but as long as they, they get a good rating on terms of being able to catch viruses and keep you secure, then, you know, go for the best one that you can, that you can afford and that's going to, you know, work the best for you. So, th th some good um, websites to do comparisons on the EV software. So, all right. And cheers. Um, and also, um, we're all, all of this is sort of circling towards data, um, and also the data that resides on your devices is is important, and it can be corporate data, personal data, and 99 times out of 100, it's always sensitive data. It's got some level of importance and sensitivity surrounding it. All devices and allow you to encrypt them. Uh, so your mobile phone can be encrypted. Just go into the settings, you can encrypt your device. Um, what encryption does is it scrambles um, the files and uh, everything that resides on that device. So it requires a certain algorithm to open and you know decipher those um, that scrambled uh, data. Um, and the reason that we would encourage you to do that is that even though you've got passwords on your laptop and you've got your antivirus and all this kind of stuff, if you lose that laptop or it's stolen, um, you know we you could remove the hard drive, plug it into a caddy and we could access the data because it's not been encrypted. So, and regardless of anything else that you've got running on there, it can it can be accessed. Just like on your phone, we could take, get your phone, we could plug that in, it would come up like a, like a USB pane on a laptop and we can access the data that resides in there if it's not encrypted. So, encryption, very important. Windows 10, um, every, every version of Windows 10, apart from the home version, it has a piece of software built in called BitLocker, and that allows you to choose the data that you want to encrypt. You can encrypt the whole system or choose the data that you want to encrypt. So you might just have certain folders that, that are sensitive and you want to make sure those are encrypted. Um, or you can encrypt USB pens with that as well. So when you plug a USB pen in, you can choose to have that encrypted. So again, that transport and the data, if you lose that pen, somebody plugs it in, they've got it. You know, there's a whole host of things behind the scenes, GDPR, all that kind of stuff, data breaches, and how that impacts businesses. So, um, yeah, encryption is um, very important. Windows 10 Home, unfortunately, it doesn't come with BitLocker, but it does have a piece of software called Device Encryption. Uh, and what that does is it basically encrypts the entire device. So you can't choose the files and folders, which some people like to do. It just encrypts the whole hard drive. Um, so when you do that, um, it can take quite a a bit of time depending on the amount of data that you have residing on that laptop or uh, PC but definitely worth considering definitely something that I would recommend that you do especially for mobile devices devices that you take out and carry about with you um, yeah definitely look at encryption um, and again there's three versions there there are paid for versions as well that, that you can look to uh, install that kind of stuff but you know generally the stuff that comes built in the operating systems is more than adequate um, and it works really well. And a hundred percent, whenever we speak to anybody, the, the, the last line of defence is yourself. So all you know, be vigilant. You know, if you are getting an email from someone that you're not expecting and it looks a bit dodgy, chances are it probably is. Um, if you're not expecting that email, just pick up the phone and ask them. You might not be, um, you might not have a virus, but that person that sent that, they could be, they could have a virus. So you know, pick up the phone, and ask them, did they send you? Um, if, it, if it doesn't look like it's, or you're not expecting it, then, you know, have they actually sent it? Scammers just now will take advantage of the situation. So we're seeing things like um, emails getting, you know, 
sent back and forward, um, kidding on that they're from HMRC or um, they're from delivery companies. People are getting things delivered now because they can't get to the shops to get them. So the, the scammers know that this is happening. So if you're waiting on a delivery and you know it's coming from DPD, but you get an email from UPS, then chances are that's dodgy. So just have a, you know, be vigilant, be aware. In any sort of security setting, you need to sort of be aware of what's going on around about you. Um, and you know, um, anything that comes as an attachment or a link, um, if you if you get an email and it is from HMRC and it's got a link on it, probably tell you not to click the link, go straight to the HMRC website, actually type it into your browser and find whatever the email is pertaining to. You know, and just you know, just be careful of what what you're what you're clicking on and what you um, what you're looking at. Again, we've also heard that uh, just now because people are at home, and um, we've got the telephone scams going on where people are calling up and kidding on. They're from Microsoft and BT. Um, Microsoft will not phone you to tell you that your PC is not working right because they don't monitor PCs. We're a Microsoft partner and we struggle to get in touch with Microsoft at times, so they ain't phoning you. And, and and if you can get BT to admit to any fault, then you know, hats off to you because they won't phone you either and tell you that there's something wrong. So, you know, these things don't actually happen. So just be just be careful and you know, be vigilant. You are the last line of defence. So all those other states that we've done in, in the previous things we've spoken about, it all falls down if you go and click on an email that's a dodgy email. You know, it's it's too late then. So just remain vigilant. Remain vigilant. That's absolutely <laughs> key. Absolutely yeah. key. Thank you, James. No uh, there's some some great tips in there for how we can we can physically make our our work premise and at home more secure by by taking those simple simple steps. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose it's great that we've got the the home office secure. But obviously, if we're working collaboratively just now, we're working remotely. We're going to be doing a whole sort of a whole range of things with people that we're we're not in the same space as. Uh, yeah. What can we do to? As you've just got up there uh, to work remotely securely and safely and uh, and collaboratively because there's nothing quite like just being able to lift your head up from the desk and shout over to the other side of the office <laughs> no. hey can you read this email for me can you no. check this file for me what can we do to in in the situation we're in just now yeah no they, they, that's probably been the biggest struggle for most people is not all the stuff that we're spoken about there it's just getting your head into the fact that you, you can do that thing you know talk to your colleague or hear things that are going on in the office so um, yeah, so we are working remotely. It's you know, for a long time, um, as a you know, an IT person, we've been speaking to customers about you know, thinking about how did they get, how did it work remotely. Um, for some people, it, it works. For other people, it doesn't. But we're being forced into a situation. Hence, why we're having this conversation, and we are working remotely. And the ways that we're working remotely is we're either accessing on-premise um, services and resources, or we're accessing cloud services. Um, so the difference between both of those are on-premise is um, all of the resources and all of the things that you would expect in the office that are physically in your office um, and we access them nine times out of ten via a VPN um, so we are dialing into the office so you click on your little v you know you open up your VPN client software you click on there it dials into the office usually through a router and a firewall and maybe a VPN um, server etc and it allows people access to all the resources that sit inside the office um, other businesses are um, complete uh, are in the cloud and they and they leverage the cloud pretty you know um, well in their business us ourselves as a new start business and um, we had sort of the luxury um, when we started up that everything that we'd done was put into the cloud now businesses that are already established it's not always quite like that it's not easy just to move straight into the cloud, there's a, you know, there's a progression there that needs to be planned and prepared and migrated properly. So um, what we tend to find is, is that most businesses have sort of like a hybrid sort of setup. They have some resources that are on premise, they have some resources that are in the cloud. So people are working remotely using them, using both aspects of that, um, of those resources. Um, so um, like I've, just, I've explained obviously your on-premise stuff is things like your back office system, so maybe a CRM, your files and folders might be hosted in there, you might be doing remote printing, um, all those kind of things that um, are not in the cloud would be on your on-premise. Your cloud services are things like Office 365, so your email um, may be coming from Office 365, it could still be on-premise as well. Things like uh, Box and Dropbox, you know, uh, collaboration storage tools, any Google services that you may use. Microsoft Teams, Zoom that we're on just, just now, these are all cloud services that we're using uh, and we're accessing 
to enable coll a collaboration between our colleagues. Some of them have been planned and they're actually part of the organization's ICT strategy. Other ones are not so much. So things like Zoom, people are maybe using that because it was the easy one to go to and it's a great tool. But again, there's been sort of reports in the media about security flaws and that, which, which they're true, you know, they are there. But again, you need to just be vigilant, you know, if it's the default password, then you can change it, change it, you know, watch who you're giving the, the link out to that kind of thing. Um, so th those are the two ways in where we're actually, where we're, what we're accessing in terms of services, whether they're on-prem or cloud. And every business is different in terms of what they use. Um, so yeah, but again, in terms of security on those, you know, make sure your passwords are secure. Um, make sure you're using things like um, two-factor authentication, if, if that's available. In most um, cloud services, things like 365 and that, will um, allow you to use two-factor authentication. So that is a password and then potentially something like a code sent, uh, a code sent by SMS to your mobile. So it's another level of security. Um, so if I've guessed your password and it sends me a code, if I've not got um, your mobile and I don't receive that code, I can't actually log in. And if you've not got that, switched on just now, you know, encourage you to look into getting that switched on, speak to your IT support people, um, ask them if they can get that uh, switched on because, uh, again, it is another great layer of um, security. They're not on by default. You usually have to uh, put them on and configure them, but get them, have a look at two-factor authentication, see if you can get that on for both for VPNs and for your cloud services. So, yeah. You mentioned, uh, obviously, Zoom there, James. It's something, like I say, it's a great tool, a tool we're using uh, quite successfully just now. And I think many of us are, are, are you doing that just now. And we have heard those concerns that have been in, in, the, in the media over the past few weeks. Uh, and I think for, for many of us, it's a case of it's been ease over anything else. It's yeah, there, yeah. it's simple. It, it just works. Uh, yeah. I know myself, we, we had con some concerns when we were trying to figure out how we were going to do this. Uh, but we made the decision, you know something, as long as we're running the, the latest version of Zoom that's in there, uh, that's probably going to be the best thing we can do. And, and again, it's funny because when I was getting set up for this morning, uh, Zoom 5.0 automatically yeah. prompted to come up into my browser and said, yeah. would you like to update to this? And it actually says, with enhanced new robust security attachments, yeah. click yeah. here to download. So I think uh, if everyone makes sure they keep those up to date, it'll yeah. be fantastic. Uh, but you also mentioned uh, Microsoft Teams. So yeah. again, one's very much focused on the, the work and uh, the work based and one's very much and for Zoom I would say more educational more family stuff is that very much the way you see it as a company yeah well so like you know Zoom is a great product but obviously Zoom is a consumer first product so when Zoom was um, first created by the people at Zoom whoever they are uh, they you know their focus was on consumers and the consumerization of um, video uh, conferencing you know they've taken that from things like FaceTime they've taken that from things like you know your Facebook messenger and video calls so they've not really had that sort of um, emphasis on what businesses would require um, whereas Microsoft and things like Teams th that is a business first um, piece of software like that, that they are designed for businesses first and then consumers come sort of second if you like so um the ease of use that zoom gives you is great but it's maybe not giving you the same levels of security it's maybe not giving you the same levels of compliance that a business first or a business grade tool would give you so again depending on what um depending on what industry or sector that you work in um zoom might not um be um a suitable a tool to use because it doesn't comply with certain industry regulations that you may have, um, whereas Microsoft Teams may do that. So in terms of GDPR and uh, compliance, um, team, uh, Microsoft Teams, because it resides on Microsoft servers uh, and it's usually part of the Office 365 suite as a company and organisation, you can request from Microsoft where your data resides. So you can, if you're a European company and it has, you know, in compliance for your sector says that it must re reside in the UK, you can ask for it, that data to reside in a UK data centre. You can ask for teams and all of the, 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 the transport of data and video calls and all that to tr pass through UK data centres. So you know that it's encrypted, you know that it's encrypted in situ, it's encrypted in transit, and it's encrypted in the data centre, and it complies to UK data legislation and EU data legislation. Things with like Zoom, um, or 
maybe things like Dropbox or um, Google, um, they don't offer you that level of sort of, um, they don't offer you that level of um, compliance, if you like. You know, you, Zoom that probably won't tell you where the data centres are. They could be all over. They could be all over the all over the place. So again, you just need to think about. Um, and again, it's a great time for businesses and people in business or business leaders or that to think about the policies and procedures. You know, things like the ICT policies and strategy. What does that look like? You know, do we need video conferencing? Zoom's working okay just now, but is it right for us? You know, do we need to look at putting an email in there? Do we need to look at offloading some of our on-premise stuff and putting it up into the cloud? Um, so a really important time to think about things like that. And then obviously when we do these things is how does that impact other things? So things like your staff's ICT use policy. Do you have a bring your own device policy? Um, does your GDPR policy, you know, tie into all of these kinds of things? Um, if you're allowing people to use their own devices, how do you control them? How do you get the data back if they, if they leave or, um, you know, that person loses that device or it's stolen? How do you control those devices? So definitely um, a, a really good time just now to actually maybe sit and think about that kind of stuff. And if if you want, I can I can share a link at the end of this. I'll give it to you, Lee, and you can, we've got a load of policies that we, you know, we sort of share with our customers. They may be... Um, they basically fill the blank in policies, if you like. So um, you can you can use those to start off these policies if you don't already have them in your um, business. And they're good sort of um, exercises and just awareness, if you like, of what you might need to leverage um, cloud services and working remotely. So we'll give those out. That would be great, James. And, and again, it's a good time to look at your ICT policies. I know at the yeah. Chamber, we had, uh, we had started at the beginning of the year, to we would made that decision to migrate everything we had to, to cloud-based service. Yeah. Uh, just again, for, for ease, for backup, for everything else like that. Uh, but one thing that was, I was, I'm going to hold my hands up here because I was struggling to get my head around. Uh, we use Microsoft System, which I think are, are great because mm -hmm. you use them at home, you use them there. It's, it's a universal thing for people to understand. It's pretty easy and straight forward but I couldn't get my head around the difference between OneDrive and SharePoint they both seem to be the the same sort of system just with a different name on them different badge on them yeah so so SharePoint is a um, it, it's actually quite an old system it's probably been around it's probably been around a good 20 years of SharePoint I remember it way back in the day when I worked in a uh, University of West of Scotland and places like that and we they used SharePoint and um, so it was basically SharePoint was devised by um, Microsoft, it was usually installed on premise and it allowed you to have an intranet effectively, so a corporate um, a website, if you like, but only accessible from inside your offices. And you would tend to have a SharePoint server, so it's, it's pretty old technology. But funnily enough, OneDrive is actually built on the SharePoint architecture, so it sits, OneDrive is a is a fancy front end for SharePoint. So everything you can do in SharePoint in terms of file storage and uh, you know, where we place files and folders, that's effectively what OneDrive does. And if you've got Office 365 in, in a professional setting, so Office 365 Business Essentials or Business Premium, then you have OneDrive as part of that Office suite. And every person gets, every user gets one terabyte of storage on Microsoft data. So it's a huge amount of storage for you to access stuff in there. But what Teams has done, Teams has went a step further and Teams um, brings all of the collaborative um, tools that are part of the Office 365 suite and it brings them together. So it's bringing things like instant messaging, um, uh, messaging boards, um, bulletin boards, it's bringing um, things like Yammer, which is a, um, it's basically a, a corporate Facebook, if you like. It's bringing um, video conferencing. You can, uh, you can actually make Teams at a certain level become your phone system so you can break out onto, uh, onto the, the telephony networks and you can, you can dial any landline number, that's going up into the enterprise level of um, uh, Teams. So Teams is the thing that is uh, it's basically like a single pane of glass that brings all of the Office 365 productivity um, suite together. Um, but the majority, of, uh, like you said there, OneDrive is built on SharePoint, so it has its limitations because it is quite old software, but definitely worth using because you have it as part of your 365 subscription. If you happen to have one of those, it's there and it's why not use it and utilize it and i think what's good about it as well is once you've once you've got it set up you can actually have that a uh, that cloud folder that cloud base actually yeah. in your file explorer on your desktop or on your mobile device so you can yeah. it's, it's literally just click and drag and and the stuff's there on demand as yeah. well so 
Yeah, so OneDrive is what we, what we would class as a sync and share um, piece of software. So it allows you to synchronise and share data. Um, so you can synchronise that data down to um, any device that you install, the, either the OneDrive app, um, or you can access it via the, the web browser and you can see that. So if you're on maybe like a public computer that, you know, um, you need to access files and folders, you can do that via a web browser, but you can also have the, the app. If you have the app, um, it will synchronise the folders that you request um, to synchronise down onto your PC or your laptop. And what that allows you to do is when you don't have connectivity, you can remain productive because you can still access those files in an offline setting. You can still make changes to them as you would normally. And when, when you do come back into sort of connectivity and get back on the internet, it will synchronise those back up to the folder in which they're saved in. So really good if you're maybe on the train or um, you're travelling um, and you've not got an internet connection, you can still remain productive. So. Yeah, that, that's what OneDrive allows you to do via what we'd call the sync and share platform. That's that's what it does. It also allows you to share those files um, to people externally from your organisation. So instead instead of sending um, an attachment in an email, which obviously um, has limitations in what you can send, but also the receiving part, you may have limitations in what they can, uh, the, the size or the file type which is coming in because of a layers of security in their email, um, you can just send a link and it would link them to OneDrive and they can download it. So it, people use things like WeTransfer and things like that. You don't need to use that. You can use OneDrive. It does the same thing. So that's what it's about. But and again, people have got that instant trust because it is Microsoft based and, and it's there and, and everything else with it. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, just on that, you mentioned apps, uh, you know, very much great because you can uh, allow them to keep you Productive, uh, productive when you're not online. But again, a lot of people we're seeing now are are not too sure about actually downloading the full versions of programs onto their uh, onto their tablets, onto their uh, maybe their, their surfaces or something like that, because they're going out and about and they've got a limited memory on them. Yeah. What do you think on on the app against the the browser based uh, versions of some of the stuff, like you say Office uh, three six five, like the uh, the email systems and such like? Yeah, so obviously with 365, if you have the version that allows you to download apps, we'd always encourage you to do that because you're paying for that luxury, if you like. And um, if you do have that version of 365 where you can download apps, um, you can install that, that license. You can install it on up to 15 devices. So you can have the full office suite so you, on 15 of your own personal devices. So you can put it on five PCs, laptops, five mobiles, five tablets. Um, so you can actually give it to your your family. You can allow that you can you can give it to whoever you need. It, 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 apps are great because if you download that, it means it's installed on the PC. So you don't need to be connected to the internet to get the functionality of opening a Word document and editing it. Um, it also gives you much more functionality over a, the web-based version of Word or PowerPoint or Excel, whatever. Um, and obviously, the big drawback. Um, of the the app or the web based applications is that you need to be on the internet to get that. So you, these are the lightweight sort of apps um, on the on the web. They sort of strip back, but they allow you to perform the, the the basic functions that you would find on the the full blown apps. But interestingly, though, Microsoft, um, their new CEO, well, he's no new, but he's, he's uh, post uh, Bill Gates, uh, a guy called Satya Nadella. Um, he now runs uh, Microsoft, and he uh, took Microsoft from a software company um, who just built software. So it was always really resource hungry. It was clunky, etc. And he turned them into um, a mobile first company. So everything that they develop is about mobility. So the apps in which you install are very, very lightweight now. Um, so and they're all about functionality. So what it, what Microsoft are, um, and most of the big software houses are doing is they want you to have the same user experience on your laptop as you would get on your mobile or your tablet. It just scales to the size of the device, but you can still um, have all of that, you know, all of those features that you would find in a full-blown system that you would find on your laptop on your mobile and on your, so yeah, if you can download the apps by, yeah, 100% use the apps over any of the web-based stuff. Web-based stuff's great if you're on a public computer and you don't have the app, it will get you by, but I wouldn't even want to use that as a as my primary um, sort of tool. So yeah. 
and you mentioned the web-based stuff is great if you can uh, access the web, yeah, which, yeah. Uh, which let's be honest, a lot of us have actually had, had some trouble with over the, the past little while. I, I'll be honest, when we got first started working from home, it was great. You know, Mrs. Med's at one side of the home office, I'm over here, we're both working away, quite the thing. Now, eight weeks in, uh, and we won't be alone in this, we've seen things starting to go a little bit slower. Uh, I've, I'm going to be honest, James, I have, have tried to, to ease some of the strain. I've got one of one of these things, oh, yeah. a little, yeah. a little uh, mobile hotspot, which I've had for a couple of years now. Uh, and again, I use that for my, my laptop, but again, it doesn't seem to be given with the, the same response time that it used to have. How can we stay connected when we've got uh, our work phones maybe connect to the Wi-Fi at home, our, our tablets, our, our PCs, and we're still trying to be as productive as, as we can be. Yeah, so, yeah, obviously, um, so when all this kicked off, the first thing we dealt with was getting people and you know ready to work from home and the first problems that we had encountered were people trying to get laptops and devices to actually work from home so people that had the pcs they couldn't take them home so first problem we came across was um laptops etc then we got people into their homes and then the next problem we were encountered was connectivity so we're trying to get them to access like we've just discussed some services that are on premise via vpn up to the cloud etc uh, and because in Dumfries and Galloway, particularly, um, it's you know it's quite a vast region, and the the connectivity changes you know drastically between locations. E even in Dumfries itself, um, we can go from anything from a, a like a, a two megabit per second connection all the way up to three hundred megabit per second just in the town of Dumfries. It's, it's absolutely crazy. And then then you add into the fact that um, everybody and their dog is now working from home. And they're all working at the same time and we've got all these devices that we spoke about um, that are all connected to the internet via that single solitary little router in the corner that's a consumer grade product that's maybe not you know positioned in the best place it's maybe not configured correctly and to give you the best um, performance then um, you, you very rapidly have issues with connectivity um, and effectively what's happened is, is because everybody's on there is an oversaturation of, of where what what people are using. If, funnily enough, if you went back to like um, your office, you'd probably get a better connection because the cabinets that your offices are coming off, are, nobody's using any of the stuff there. So, um, yeah, and, and again, you've got because everybody's at home. Think of all the things that are happening, all the devices that you've got. If they're all connected to your router, they are all, all they're all facing the internet. So they're all doing automatic updates behind the scenes. They're all speaking to the internet constantly. Um, so if you're struggling at home, turn off the devices that you're not using. So switch your legs off, turn your TV off, um, turn your, uh, disable the Wi-Fi on your mobile. Only use the Wi-Fi on the devices that you that you that you need, um, and maybe that might make a bit of a difference. Also, in terms of connectivity in your house, um, one of the problems that we've came people get mixed up a bit about broadband and Wi-Fi. Um, so broadband is the internet service that comes across your phone line and it comes in at a certain speed. Why, if you're on a Wi-Fi device and it's slow, it, it's not always the broadband that's the issue. It's the distance between your device and the Wi-Fi. It could be lots of different uh, situations inside your house, like the thickness of the walls, the, the location of the router. So that, you know, encourage people, if you can, move the router to the most central location in your house, get it as centre as possible. So you've got an equal distance of um, Wi-Fi transmission around the house. Um, it's not always easy because um, you need to plug that into power. You might not have power in that location. You've obviously got the physical uh, broadband uh, telephone line that's come out of the master socket. Where do you put it? But these are sort of two different um, issues that you have there. But um, but in terms of connectivity and what, what what's available and what, how are they different? You know, everybody's got broadband pretty much um, of different flavours and different speeds, etc. And like I said, the variance of that across the region, even across just Dumfries and the town, it can be great. Um, the first sort of incarnation of broadband into your house was what we call ADSL, so that would give you speeds up to about 8 megabits per second. Um, the second incarnation of that, ADSL2, gave you speeds up to about 20 megabits per second. Then you had fibre to the cabinet, which is You'll have seen OpenReach putting the, the big cabinets out on the roads with a big sticker on, you know, fibre's now available. That brings a fibre connection to that cabinet and then a copper connection to your house comes across your phone line. And that took us from maybe 20 
anything up to 20 megabits per second, up to 80 megabits per second. But that depends on certain things like the distance from that cabinet or the exchange. The further away you get, the slower the speeds get. The, the stability is not always there as well. Um, and then we've got, in some cases, fibre to the premises. So we've got a couple of locations in Dumfries where they have a fibre connection straight into the building. Um, and you're paying sort of speeds that are similar, uh, you're paying prices that are similar to um, what you would pay just for the standard broadband connections. But there's lots of factors in there that cause it to be unstable and cause issues with speed. So if you have a, a broadband connection in, in your house, which most people uh, do, you're actually sharing that line with everybody that's on your street. So wherever the cabinet is, if you know where that is, maybe it's at the top of the street if you like and you're at the bottom and there's 40 houses, 20 on each side of the road and you're number 40, then that cable that comes into your house has been split up 40 times. So when everybody jumps on the internet at the same time, it causes the slowdown, it causes the disconnections, all that kind of stuff. And what the ISPs do is they do a thing called traffic shaping. So they will make sure everybody gets an equal slice of the pie, but when the pie is not very big, to start with, it's difficult to divide that up to everybody. So then you have issues where you can't connect onto things like Zoom. Um, we, we had a case, someone, a customer, uh, and an employee working from home in, in King and Key, to, in, in two megabit per second broadband, which is paying for stuff up to 20. But because of the distance from the exchange, that's what she's getting. She couldn't even dial into the VPN at work. So what we'd done there was, you know, we had to give her an alternative, and that alternative, you know, we were well positioned to give her a, a 4G um, router. So a route, not like your um, MiFi unit that you've got there, an actual, like a full-blown router that takes a SIM card. So like the um, the router that you've got in your house, instead of the ADSL cable that comes out of your BT socket, it's got a SIM card on there, and, you know, we chose the best network according to where, where she was. Um, and she went from 2 megabits a second to about 30 megabits a second. Um, and, you know, we've given her that just as a temporary sort of solution um, until, you know, she gets back to work and stuff like that. So there are alternatives, 4G being one of those. Um, it is good, but obviously it's having issues as well because of the amount of people that are using those devices. Because we're at home and working from home, we may not have our um, office telephone system available to us, so we're maybe using our mobiles more, so there's congestion on all the networks. Um, but I guess, yeah, I dare say, you know, in terms of uh, connectivity and trying to find the best time, you know, um, you know, just try and work around about when you think the busy periods may be, if it means, you know, maybe getting up a little bit earlier in the morning to miss the mad rush, or people getting up at eight, nine o'clock or whatever, and turning on the smart TVs and streaming Netflix and the kids on the Xbox, and maybe do it a couple hours before that or a couple hours after, or, um, yeah, and, and what the other option that we've put up there for the really, really sort of unlucky people that don't get broadband or 4G is that in Dumfries and Galloway, there's the option of satellite connectivity. It's not the best, but it can get you out of some situations, and you've in the, in the past installed that in some really, really remote locations, and it does work. It gives you a a, a much better connection than maybe what you would have got on the other ones that don't work. So yeah, that, that, that's the sort of connectivity piece. It is the, the glue that holds it all together, I guess, all that stuff that we spoke about previously. If, if you can't connect, then it's, everything else is irrelevant. So it is, again, an important thing, but difficult in some situations to overcome connectivity issues. But hopefully um, you can do some wee things with your router and stuff like that, reposition it, try and work at certain different times of the day, uh, turn off devices that are not required, that you're not required, that may be on the internet and using some bandwidth, turn them off and, you know, just, yeah, try your best, I guess. If we were just going to have a, a, just, just a ballpark figure, James, on that, that, that 4G router, uh, which is also different from the, the little MiFi one that, that I, I use for my different to try to get me out of scrapes. What's the, the retail cost at that on, on say, a, a per month charge? Yeah, so there's a, I mean, uh, there's a few options, obviously. Um, there's, a, there's, a router, there's a cost to the router, obviously, the device cost, and, and that's about £125 XVAT. It's a one-off cost, so you pay for that, and that router's then yours. Um, and depending on what network you go on, so like O2, it's about £20, uh, it's £20 a month um, XVAT. That's for unlimited data usage. There is a fair usage policy with O2, 650 gig, but that's usually more than adequate for most households. 
and then you've got Vodafone, it's uh, £26 a month, it's VAT, and it's completely unlimited, there is no fair use policy on that. So again, it's just a matter of finding what is the best, um, what's the best signal that you've got in, in, in your house. Sometimes you go outside of the house, what's be perfect to come in the house, absolutely terrible. Um, so there are options with these um, routers that you can get, you can um, plug in external antennas, so effectively you're getting the signal from outside and you're bringing it into the house, and then the router does all of the other stuff, so it connects you to the internet, gives you the Wi-Fi, all that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, there's a few options available in that. Um, we do provide them, but um, that you know, again, if you have like a MiFi unit, and it's maybe the MiFi unit that might be the um, issue, and you're maybe looking for a more robust um, router solution, then you know you could use your SIM card and you could pop that into into one of the routers. They're not locked to a network. You put any. Uh, SIM cards you want in there, um, so you may already have a data connection. Use it, you know, if it's if it means it works a little bit better. And it would, you know, again, it sort of splits the load up if you like. You know, if you've still got your ADSL, your fibre broadband, uh, but you want to use the SIM card for your for your um, work, then you know it's splitting up a wee bit. You're keeping your own sort of little private network if you like. Um, so yeah, there's a few options available there. So we've we've covered the security now that we're at home. We're, we're, we've got our security sorted, which is great. We're, we've got our connectivity sorted, which is fantastic. So we can actually work from home. We can work securely, and we we'll know how we're going to do it with those those apps, and whether they're on our laptops, whether they're in the cloud, uh, which is fantastic. But dare I say it, James, this is all going to come to an end <laughs> at some point. Yeah, and uh, and we're actually going to have to think about going back into uh, back into a normal work based environment, back into the office. Uh, just like we said at the start, the steps we should probably take when we're trying to secure our systems from working at home. Uh, should I just go back into the office on Monday morning, plug my laptop in, and, and, and Bob's your uncle, it's, it's going to be great as it always was, or should I be taking some other security steps before I connect it back onto my network? Yeah, I guess, so, you know, that is obviously the risk of remote working, is that, you know, what, are you, what device are you working on? Um, has it been kept up to date? Has it of all of those steps that were spoken about? If if you do all of those and you and you make sure that that happens, then you're in a much better position to return. Now, if you have um, someone that does your IT for you, I would encourage you to speak to them. And you know, if you know when you're going to go back, and I know it's a bit uncertain now, but I would I would imagine that you would plan a sort of staged return to work where certain people are going back. You, you know, you're you're going to have to sort of practice that social distancing thing, so you might not be able to return the whole workforce back. So certainly the people that are coming back, um, you know, get those devices to your IT support company, um, ask them to check them, just give them the once over, make sure that all of the steps that were spoken about have actually been taken and, uh, you know, the, the devices are secure, they're up to date, all that kind of stuff. Um, but certainly, you know, like, if you, if you have a... Um, if you have people working remotely, when they come back, it is always a is always an issue. So again, they're going to return back to your network. So what have you done on your network when you've been closed to make sure that your servers are up to date? All those steps of safety to take about your home devices, make sure the same things happening in your corporate network that you know they're all patched, they're up to date. You know, take that time now, speak to your IT support people, and make sure they're on top of that, which I'm sure they are because you know. You know, the ones that I know of, certainly the services that they deliver, um, just like ourselves, they will be doing that. They will be constantly monitoring, making sure things are up to date. And because of the downtime as well, it's, it is easier to do things like updates. There's always a, an apprehension with updates on things like servers because it's about scheduling in at the right time. Um, so now that people are in, in at home, it's maybe a good time to make sure that they're up to date and do all that essential maintenance that you've maybe not... Um, um, prioritise because you're too busy in the workplace. Use this, you know, use this to your advantage and get everything up to date. But so there's sort of two aspects to that: is the devices coming back in. If you followed the steps that we've spoken about today, you'll be in a much better position. But also, you will be coming back to a network that's potentially not been um, used to what its normal capacity is. So make sure that you've been doing those steps as well on on all those corporate um, devices. Um, and yeah, just you know, again, just be vigilant. You know, just Take, take your time and uh, be vigilant and if you need any advice then you know ask for it you know ask your IT companies you know we're here if you need us and um, more than happy to sort of give any sort of advice that we can to people um, because yeah it's um, 
again, another one of these buzzwords, unprecedented times, I guess, and, you know, it, the, it is the time to sort of help each other out and make sure that we um, get back to work and we do it safely. And whether it be from a physical point of view or a digital point of view, let's make sure we get back safe. Just on that, James, thank you very much for, for that offer. If people do want to get in touch with with yourself or any of the team at Grobetti maybe they have a, a question, maybe that, that hasn't been answered here, maybe that something's just going to come into their head over the next couple of days. Uh, how easy is it to get in touch with you guys? Yeah, I've sort of, sort of schoolboy error here. I should have put up the contact details on that last slide. So, uh, no, so you can obviously, our website's in, uh, under construction just now. So, um, the guys at Hoggett are doing that for us. Um, but you can contact us via email, so just um, hello at cubity.co.uk um, on our telephone number 01387 uh, um, Yeah, just drop us a line, give us a call, contact us via social media, um, and we'll be more than happy to sort of help you out with anything you like. And also, if you want leave, I'll send if you want to send those out to anybody that's logged in, along with that link to the the policies that we can share with our contact details and again if we can help we're, we're, that's what we're here to do more than happy to assist in any way we can so thank you very much that'd be great james thank you so very much for taking the time uh, yeah. to be with us here today uh, as part of this webinar was certainly lots of little hints lots of little tips that we have picked up in there uh, and just one final question that, that's came in for how do you actually get your own backdrop designed uh, for zoom calls how easy is it because i've got a couple of pop-up banners here not as fancy as you but how easy is it to get one of those is, virtual ones uh, just in the settings in zoom you can do a background and you can upload any picture so that is just the front cover of our catalogue so it's just you upload it and it's there yeah so it sort of blanks out the mess that's behind me with piles of pcs and old routers and stuff like that you know so now you just upload it in the settings there um, and your profile on zoom and it's there it's also good as well if you've got your camera switched on you know you've got a sort of presence there that, so people know who it is that's dialed in so um one of the other guys from cubit is logged in but he's obviously no figured out how to do either so he's just pointed it to the big picture on our wall with a Q on it so <laughs> It's all about the branding. <laughs> it's all about branding. Yeah. It's spot on. Uh, James, again, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. If you want to watch it again, it's going to be available on demand uh, in around about 24 hours' time. The link will be sent out via email as well as being on all our socials. And if you uh, want to keep up to date with what's going on at DG Chamber, it is www.dgchamber.co.uk. All the socials, just search for DG Chamber. And our next webinar comes your way next Wednesday afternoon. I'm going to be joined by uh, Rick. Richard Harris, who is the Chief Executive of Westfield Health. He's going to be uh, taking us through the steps that we can take for uh, our own well-being, looking after both ourselves and our team during this strange, strange time that we are living in. You can uh, register for that by going to the DG Chamber website and following the links that are on there.